Chapter Fourteen of Miss Pym's Camouflage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Miss Pym's Camouflage by Lady Dorothy Stanley. Chapter Fourteen. At Aachen, the train stopped, and Miss Pym, quite stiff, aching in every limb, reached the platform. She made her way to the buffet. It was evening, her first evening in Germany. She determined to appear as a bona fide traveller and to order and pay for her supper for some time she sat in the restaurant at a table covered with white american cloth and finding no one came she called to a german waitress and asked for some food the woman with languid indifference demanded her bread butter and meat cards but i am a traveller just arrived from belgium i have no card you might in that case be permitted government soup and some ersatz cafe coffee made from a substitute but most people coming into germany bring food you are not german though and your accent is not dutch said the woman suspiciously no replied miss pym i am swiss i am a governess i went to brussels to take my pupils into holland i am now rejoining the mother of my pupils in berlin we have been in switzerland well you would have done better to stay in holland there is great want here it is not because of the price of food but because food is unobtainable we just get sufficient to keep life in our bodies but not enough to work on they do say we shall get some corn from the romanian harvest but we poor people will not see much of that miss pym was now treated to a cup of broth made with hot water oatmeal and some kind of unsound fish i really don't think i can swallow this said miss pym eyeing the mess with aversion yet it is good soup said the woman looking hungrily at the steaming cup then let me see you drink it oh i will pay for it of course added miss pym there is no one here sit down and drink it the woman unable to resist seated herself at the table and noisily gulped down the soup oh that was good she exclaimed wiping her mouth on her apron but is there nothing you could give me asked miss pym rather anxiously the woman now gratefully inclined went off to search returning with a cup of substitute coffee without milk or sugar a few stewed plums and a very small piece of what she called gingerbread miss pym had to be satisfied with this but she ate without appetite the woman watched her with some amusement ah you are dainty now because you come from a land of plenty but wait a bit you will soon feel willing to gnaw your shoes miss pym asked her where to find the best hotel and at what time the train left for berlin the trains just now are crowded with wounded yes and with dead too said the woman lowering her voice oh it is a fearful sight two three years ago these same trains brought english prisoners but all that is changed those terrible english are now taking our boys prisoners and they have guns so powerful they will soon be able to hit aachen from france then as travellers entered noisily she made out the bill saying the fast train to cologne starts at nine o'clock in the morning you should be here at half past eight and the hotel of the royal eagle is five minutes walk from the station to your right miss pym knew that she could not enter the hotel without passport and police permits so she resumed invisibility and softly left the station the eagle hotel was crowded with officers and after diligent search not an unoccupied room could she find farther down the bahnstrasse she found another and smaller hotel the crown here also every room was taken it was very difficult to see her way now as the town was ill-lighted in the quieter quarters noticing a card in the window signifying that bed and board could be had there she determined to risk it and ask a lodging for the night a thin severe woman opened the door miss pym explained that she wanted to stay the night that she had come from holland and was on her way to berlin why do you not go to the hotel asked the woman mistrusting the foreign accent i tried both hotels replied miss pym but they have not a spare room so i walked on and found your house 
my luggage is at the station have you been to the police asked the woman still suspicious oh yes said miss pym in despair but i have not got any bread or meat tickets you must have a traveller's card that will do said frau hoffmann not to-night said miss pym the police will only give me my card to-morrow morning there is another inn down this road said the woman stepping out and pointing vaguely in the darkness but there are so many soldiers and those hotels are so noisy they do not seem the right sort of place for a lonely woman please take me in i pay well somewhat mollified frau hoffmann admitted miss pym i can give you a sleeping-room and to-morrow i can give you breakfast but i cannot provide you with food to-night miss pym agreed to everything and never asked the price which favourably impressed her hostess who led her into a small room lighted to miss pym's surprise by an electric lamp it was severely furnished a solid chest of drawers chair and table polished to such a degree that the light was reflected over and over again by every piece of furniture the floor was painted and waxed and polished till it shone like a mirror the bed was huge and billowy the linen spotless certainly cleanliness reigned here almost it seemed to the exclusion of charm but peace and forgetfulness were all miss pym desired and these she found in the softest of feather beds the dreadful ersatz kaffee the next morning made her realize that the daily meals would be a difficulty but she would have no scruples in helping herself now from the tables or shops of german people especially of the well-to-do frau hoffmann sourly made out her bill and saw her lodger depart with evident relief she had felt all was not well miss pym had not shown a police permit and she had looked rather english for all she professed to be swiss how was it her boots had the name of an english maker frau hoffmann might have notified the police of her suspicions but the police gave trouble she herself might become suspect had she not trouble enough with johann hoffmann her husband at the front and albert her son in training she would charge miss pym double to pay for the anxiety she had given her miss pym paid with a kind smile and earnest thanks whereupon hard-visaged frau hoffmann burst into tears and between her sobs she said take the name of the english maker off your boots fraulein sooner or later you will be caught and you will certainly be shot never attempt to move without a police permit if you do you will be handed over to the police i risked taking you in last night because money is so very scarce and the food bad as it is costs much i gave you no food because really there is none in the house but here is a hard-boiled egg i cannot send you on your journey starving i keep five hens concealed in an attic and sometimes i am fortunate enough to get an egg or two miss pym saw that a refusal would hurt the poor woman so she gratefully accepted it with a neat little packet of salt and hastening to the aachen station took a ticket to cologne a secret service official was on the platform but he was busy with passengers leaving germany and took no notice of passengers bound for cologne possibly also miss pym's get-up so eminently serviceable had a rather german look the rucksack the cloth hat with cock's feathers looking very like the tyrolese hat the stout laced boots all suggested made in germany so miss pym walked up and down the platform unmolested amid a crowd of poor people and some soldiers two trains passed to cologne with blinds down and the red cross painted on the carriages before the train she awaited was made up then she took her place in the second class not without a struggle two germans in succession tried to hustle her one man nearly shoved her off the step as she was climbing in another flung himself on to her lap and declared it was his place but the conductor finding the man had only a third-class ticket was very wroth and pitched him out on the platform the man in no way resented the violence of the official but shook his fist at miss pym as the train moved out 
Miss Pym could not help laughing, which so enraged the man that he jumped up to the step and spit at Miss Pym through the window, letting himself down as the train gathered speed. Very bad manners, observed a fellow traveller, to spit at a German. Perhaps he guessed I was Swiss, said Miss Pym, but it is bad manners to spit at any one. Excepting an English person, said the German, a stout professor, with a black mane brushed back and wearing spectacles. I accept no one, said Miss Pym stoutly. It is degrading to the person who does it. Well, there are cases when it is the right thing to do. I am proud to say I spat at the ladies of the British Embassy at Berlin. I happened to be at the station, said the professor, taking a copy of Kant out of his capacious pocket. Have you ever read this remark of Kant's? said Miss Pym severely. I will not in my own person degrade the dignity of humanity. The professor looked at Miss Pym with some surprise. Zo, you read our immortal Kant. He is ours too, cried Miss Pym inadvertently, for his mother was Scotch. The professor, with a malignant glow of pleasure and triumph, exclaimed, Zo, you are a Scotch. No, said Miss Pym, my mother was Scotch. I am Swiss, from Bern. Then, said the professor, see, I spit on your mother, and he expectorated violently on the foot rug. This infuriated a German woman with her two daughters. She yelled for the conductor, who bustled in, looking very severe. The three German ladies all spoke together and pointed to the floor of the carriage. The conductor glared at the professor and pointed to the notice. Verboten zu rauchen, smoking is forbidden. In vain the professor made assurances that he had not been smoking. He was dragged out of his seat and hauled off to a smoking compartment. On the seat he left Kant and a dark meerschaum pipe, which evidently had fallen out of his pocket. Miss Pym rose and hurried after him in the corridor, handing him the book and the pipe. The professor was rather taken aback. Then he smiled and exclaimed, forgive and miss pym smiled back later when they met in the restaurant car he became quite chatty and attentive and naively talked a great deal about himself he was so interested in his subject that he forgot to ask any awkward questions miss pym learnt that there was to be a kind of congress of professors at cologne to discuss war aims and peace professor schnupt took gave Miss Pym his card and begged her to attend the Congress, especially on the third day, when he was to speak. Are all the German professors to talk on war aims? asked Miss Pym. Certainly, replied the professor. It is a boundless subject, and all shades of opinion will be represented. There will be Turks and Bulgarians, as well as Hungarians and Austrians. The Turkish view ought to be interesting, said Miss Pym dryly. Certainly it will be interesting. The Turks have very progressive war aims. Their culture is exceedingly advanced. Really, Fraulein, you should attend, especially when I read my paper. What point of view do you take? A moderate point of view. It is useless to make exorbitant demands. We must not utterly crush the European nations, as we need them for trading with and therefore we must insist on friendly relations. I have a fine passage on the brotherly love of nations. The German, of course, having a higher morality, has a higher mission in the world. He must educate the world and teach nations the true spirit of humanity. It is very terrible to think how little the German nature is understood by other races. We feel no ill will towards any people. Once we have made peace, we shall cordially offer the hand of friendship to all. We shall trade with all. One of the conditions of our peace will be free markets, free seas, and freedom of all routes of trade. We must, alas, insist on a large indemnity, because otherwise we shall be ruined, and our victory will be equivalent to a defeat. Belgium and the north of France we must retain, and our colonies must be restored with a portion of the enemy's colonies as compensation. After all, seeing how this war was forced on us, our program is, I think, exceedingly moderate and magnanimous. We are undertaking a great task, 
that of enlightening foreign peoples but we shall not flinch the outcome of our labour will be the gradual uplifting of the whole human race professor schnupptuk's eyes glowed with fervour and he seemed to swell as he noisily ate the excellent dinner set before him miss pym listened with interest mingled with astonishment she could not feel angry the professor was so ridiculous he was quite ignorant of facts and lived entirely in the realms of fantasy she made no comment but looked dreamily out of the windows of the car then feeling it incumbent to make some remark she asked abruptly how is it that we can have such a good meal on the train when it is so difficult to get food elsewhere ah that is politics neutrals travel they are well fed so they report germany is not starving and the enemy trembles for i have it on excellent authority the english are dying of hunger miss pym laughed so heartily that she attracted the attention of travellers who glared at her she blushed and repented suddenly a huge german in a kind of knitted nightcap came swaying towards her and stood balancing himself by extremely dirty hands spread on the table so he exclaimed you laugh and there is war going on everywhere he glared at her so furiously that miss pym felt convulsed by laughter she buried her face in her paper serviette the professor very angry rose and glared at the other man this lady is with me address your questions to me repeat your question the huge man looked vaguely round and returned to his seat and the incident was closed but miss pym understood that she was now living amidst a strange savage people who looked on every one even neutrals as possible enemies it therefore behooved her to go warily End of chapter 14